we have here uh, Gerwald Oberleitner, which is no question where he's from, uh, with a name like that, uh, from Azure and Microsoft, and he's going to talk to us about what DevOps people can look at in Azure and what machine learning can be used in that kind of world. Pretty new market, isn't it, if you think about it? But we've been doing it differently, very different in the last few years. A pretty new market, and uh, I think especially new also to data scientists, which is a big topic here as well. And uh, we'll try to address how dev uh, developers and data scientists can collaborate in a process like DevOps. Well, that's a high hope, so let's go for it. Let's go. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Um, Welcome developers, welcome data scientists. I hope you had a great conference so far. Um, my name is Gerwald Oberleitner, and um, I will talk about DevOps for the next 30 minutes. Uh, hope that we have some fun together and uh, spend some great time together here. Brief introduction of uh, myself. Uh, you can reach out via LinkedIn to me um, and um, uh, connect uh, with me there. Um, I do work for Microsoft uh, for quite a time, um, currently in a, um, a technical sales role, pre-sales role, where I do help customers to adopt our cloud services, and um, especially um, Azure and Azure DevOps. I do fairly often uh, speak at conferences, like here, so I hope you find uh, that interesting. For the beginning, I wanted to set a little bit the stage what, uh, what DevOps is, and uh, that we have a common understanding how to define it. Um, the definition was done um, at Microsoft by um, a colleague and very good friend who said DevOps is the union of people, processes, and tools uh, to enable continuous delivery of value. And there is a lot in this sentence. So there is of obviously a team who needs to agree on following a certain process. Uh, we need to agree on the process itself and also stick to that process. So it doesn't make sense to leave parts of the process out because it's not uh, convenient uh, to do certain things, yeah, like a retrospective um, after a sprint. Uh, so if we leave certain parts out, so we also miss something in the process. Yeah? When we leave out the retrospective because we don't feel comfortable, we don't have any learning or don't, we don't have any um, uh, experience or any talks how we can improve and how we can uh, become more effective. Of course, products can support us to follow that process and to orchestrate it, to better work together as a team. Uh, but the most important of, uh, part of this sentence is um, continuously de deliver value. So if there is not something we gain out of such a process, there is no reason to do it. And um, the reason to do it is when we see value in it um, and we achieve certain key performance indicators, key values better than before. So what could be these indicators which make us successful with DevOps? It could be that um, we have a better time to market, or it's definitely a mechanism to have a better time to market. Um, realize product services faster, have a lower failure rate, because DevOps also means a lot of automation and a lot of um, um, uh, non-manual processes. Um, we are faster in changing things, so we have a less lead time for changes. And due to the high automation, we are also able to recover faster uh, from potential failures in our application or service. When you think about why is this important, so probably everybody of you has a smartphone. and. Um, has uh, apps on the smartphone. Um, I think you will rarely use that this application or the rarely observe that these applications uh, get frequently updated because this mostly happens overnight. Uh, you probably just get a notification uh, about my smartphone, has had, uh, my smartphone app has been updated. Um, 
but updates are quite frequently. So the most popular applications, they update two or three times a week. And if you don't have a well-defined process for that, you, you, are, you are simply not able to do that. So you can't really stick to that speed uh, of the requirement of deploying fastly and fix failures in a, in a fast manner. Especially this market, when you look into smartphones, that's a very, let's say, um, brutal market in terms of feedback and in terms of uh, customers um, uh, rating for the app and, and, and giving you direct feedback. So you have the stars, uh, which give a certain rating about the app, but they are also free, a free comment field where you get uh, immediately direct feedback and where there is the need also to react on that feedback you are getting. So looking a little bit more deeply into DevOps um, and what are key elements out of DevOps is that DevOps has become the de facto standard for modern applications, either cloud applications, mobile applications, web applications, which developers are following. And that doesn't have any relation to a specific language, frameworks, or tools you are using. Um, this is more or less a general process. There are three key elements in DevOps, um, which we also will see today and talk a little bit more deeply. One of it is continuous integration, so that you are consistently able to build your software, um, apply quality matters to it, um, and have a um, a, a continuous um, a delivery in your, uh, in, in your coding. With continuous deployment, you are able to ship that artifact you are producing um, out of your coding uh, in a highly automated manner. So you have the uh, possibility um, to deploy either to a but test systems, staging systems, production systems, um, in a continuous way without a lot of manual processes. And one of the most important parts is the part of continuous learning and monitoring, so that you also get feedback about the application and how you are doing with your, with your app. Especially when you think about modern applications, like cloud applications or mobile applications, there is not any server you can go to and observe log files or have a view onto uh, some, um, some log information of your application. Um, especially in modern applications, this is a very important part because you need to implement other and different, um, uh, other and different um, uh, appli uh, application behavior um, so that you get feedback, that you get performance indicators that you get crash reports reported back uh, to you as a uh, developer or owner of that application. Developers are quite familiar with agile processes for a couple of years. We started with something we called application lifecycle management, which was then enhanced by this learning and monitoring and feedback, feedback, park, uh, feedback part and evolved to DevOps by adding uh, that uh, feedback component. Developers are using agile processes like Scrum to orchestrate the work, collaborate in Git repositories and um, agile planning for quite a time. And also with that, we did form interdisciplinary teams. So we have developers, testers, data scientists, UI experts working together in a unified team. That's also the case at Microsoft, and we did that at Microsoft even a step further because we also changed the internal job titles of, of those uh, people. So we don't have a dedicated software developer or a dedicated software developer in test anymore. So we changed all their titles to become engineers. And these are engineering teams and engineers specializing on a special functionality. But there is no obvious 
distinction between who has which role. And more frequent releases deliver continuous value. It's something we're also practicing in the development world for quite a time. A good ex example for that is Microsoft itself. So there are a whole lot of deployments going on each day. It's around 80,000 deployments we are doing to our cloud platforms, um, which requires about four and a half million builds per month to run continuous integration uh, and to continuously build the software changes uh, into uh, executable code. And the collaboration part is about touching about 5 million work items, so 5 million tickets each day, which could be requirements, which could be uh, backlog items or tasks we need to do and implement, but which could also be reports of defects or bugs uh, which are handled via these uh, work items or tickets. But how can data scientists participate in that process? So the difficult part about integrating artificial intelligence or machine learning technology into our application is not the technology itself. It's also not, also not about the, the math or the statistics or understanding the, the, data, the data scientist world. It's more about the challenge getting the model deployed along with our application and also to have that model or the data science part we are uh, putting into our application to keep it operational and supportable and also follow this process of continuous deployment and continuous integration along with the developer part. So the data science world is a little bit different. Uh, we have different pain points in that area, as the tools are very different to that what developers are using, at least today. Um, it's a completely different landscape of uh, languages and artifacts we are producing. The testing and training of a model is also a fairly different process. Could require much more time than actually building the application. Um, and could least up to hours or days to really train our models. What we do to build these machine learning artifacts is commonly seen that it's not versioned in any form right now. So in the world of a developer with source code, we check source code into a code repository. In most cases, this is Git. And with that, we get also versioning of our source code. So we have a history. We can step back. We can review changes that have been made uh, to the code. With machine learning, that's often not the case right now. For that, Microsoft also developed the guidance or best practices for how an agile process can look, can look in the data science world. And we call this a team data science process, um, address all different kinds of stages of an agile development there. And this team data science process should enable the collaboration with developers or between developers and data scientists uh, through proven practices and through proven, through the proven structure we can provide uh, throughout that process. We want to move away from being that a data scientist is being the, the lonely wolf, so developing the models on his own desk with the probably server underneath his desk, moving to a team approach and to a team world. And there is a tool set which could enable that. Um, the cloud is a very, provides a very good tool set for that uh, because it's easy accessible and available on demand. And therefore, you can use also as a data scientist services like Azure DevOps, a cloud-based storage, 
components like Spark or Hadoop in the cloud, and something which we call Azure Machine Learning, which, we, which I will explain in a minute in a, in a little bit more depth. How could such a process look like in, in more detail? And that's an example here how collaboration could look like. The developer working in his very well-known world, um, in his development environment, either Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code or uh, any other development environment of his choice, checking in code to a Git repository, the data scientist using his tools um, like Python or Jupyter Notebooks, also with the ability to share what he creates through a Git repository so that everyone in the team can observe the work which has been done and look at the current state of the development which has been done. At a later time in the project, especially when it comes to building the code and then deploying application, the process is coming together. So that's a point where we bring together these two different technologies, put it into one central release process or release pipeline, and then release our application to devices, to a server infrastructure, to a Kubernetes infrastructure, whatever technology base we have chosen. To accomplish that, what are, what are criteria for enabling such a an, such an process or for building such a process? As said before, the, the cloud or an enterprise-ready cloud is an ideal platform for that. It's an ideal platform to enable collaboration. Because the cloud is available on demand, you pay for the resources you are using. So especially when you are training your models, when you need at a certain point high compute power, um, which is not required all the time, that's something you can get from the cloud very easily. It's very easy to collaborate with others either internal people or probably also collaborating with external partners or external developers which are helping out in a project, while you still have high security in place for your project. And with this on-demand capacity, experimentation is really made easy because you can get capacity at the point it's needed. When you look for a suitable cloud platform, there are a few things um, you should look for. Um, it's um, a cloud that is embracing open source, um, offering you open, uh, open development platform, also built-in DevOps capability for developers as well as for data scientists, tools and applications that are also available as a managed service, so that you don't need to build out this infrastructure all by your own, so that you can use a SaaS service or another managed component. Easy access to compute resources, and also a global availability of those services if you want to roll out your application in different geographies. And the sample cloud platform for, them, for that could be Microsoft Azure, um, providing a lot of those capabilities, um, like Visual Studio Code as an editor being available on multiple platforms, Azure DevOps or GitHub providing this collaboration um, and um, centralized data storage of the artifacts you are developing, services which are not particular a Microsoft application or a Microsoft world, like Databricks, which is a Spark service, or also hosted web environments where 
a Tomcat or Apache server is available as well. Regarding compute resources, there are, there are specially prepared data science VMs, which have pre-installed a tool stack which is commonly used by data scientists. But also, there are virtual machine types available which have GPUs inside so that they can do a more extensive compute, as well as a container platform. And there is global availability. So we just closed out the last continent with Azure and building uh, two uh, data center regions in South Africa. So Azure is now really globally available in each of the continents. To switch over and look into a little bit more detail what you can use to accomplish uh, those, uh, those tasks, let's at the begin make a differentiation between what kind of EI you are using for such a process. So everything we have talked about until now and the rest of the talk is about building your own artificial intelligence or your own machine learning uh, projects and applications. There is a second part available as well, where there are pre-configured and predefined services, which we call cognitive services, which is more the developer play. So that's the translation service, the face recognition service. Those are APIs which are used by developers and can be very easily integrated in applications. But when you have the need to build your own models and your own application, then you are in the world of DevOps and all these uh, challenges we have been talking about. To make it easier for data scientists, there are specialized services. So one of these specialized services is Azure Machine Learning. You will hear about Azure Machine Learning much more in the next talk by my colleague Robert, where you can prepare data, where you have mechanisms to build and train your model, and also have a distribution component, how to store your models and how to deploy it. There's a special functionality uh, which we are using in the demo and sample, a sample application in a minute um, in, Azure machine, in the Azure Machine Learning Service, which is called Model Management and, and Deployment, uh, where we have a built-in functionality to keep track about the models, what, the, what training data we have used, what the scoring of the models was, what the results was, and also a versioning, so that we have a good overview of which version or which training data resulted in a passing score for us or in a, in a suitable score for our application. To achieve this collaboration, we are using Azure DevOps. And Azure DevOps is a SaaS-based service in Azure delivering five key components. With Azure Boards, we have all these planning aspects and um, work item tracking and tickets uh, where we collaborate on. Azure Repos is a standard Git repository, uh, which we'll also see in the demo. The most important part will be Azure Pipelines, because Azure Pipelines is an infrastructure which enables us to continuously build and continuously deploy our application and artifacts. And that, regardless of language used or the platform we are using. So Azure Pipelines do host Windows machine, Linux machines, but also Macintosh machines or Macs in the cloud, which are available for your build and deployment tasks. So pipelines are a key component. Pipelines can deal with any language, any platform, any cloud, are extensible, and can also create artifacts or deploy to a container infrastructure or a Kubernetes platform which we will also use in our example uh, later on. If you are hosting your code on GitHub and doing open source projects, there is also an integration with GitHub and Azure Pipelines. And there is some really nice service we are offering in that regards as well, 
because we are embracing open source, working with open source, we also do have a free offer for GitHub users uh, in using Azure pipelines. So if you are hosting a public repository, either on Azure DevOps, in the Azure DevOps repo, or on GitHub, you get unlimited build minutes on Azure pipelines for the Windows, Linux, and macOS platform. You get 10 parallel build or release tasks you can use for your project, which really enables you also as an open source developer to use continuous integration, to use continuous deployment and the benefits you gain out of this process without any additional costs. So it's free, as GitHub is free for public repositories. With that, let's spend the remaining minutes uh, to walk through a little demo. And uh, therefore, I will quickly switch screen here. And I have prepared an open. Sorry, that's not what I wanted. I've prepared here a couple of views uh, we are going through. So that could be a potential. So what, 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 what did I do? So I created a small uh, sample application, which is a web application using a machine learning model, which is deployed as a container in the, in the back end. And this project is hosted in Azure DevOps. This dashboard could be a potential home page or kind of home page for your uh, project, giving you an overview about your project and important KPIs. Uh, in my case, the work that is assigned to me, how my continuous deployment or release pipeline is doing, how my build pipeline is doing, how much work do I have in the sprint remaining, and what my sprint dates are, as well as team members who are working on that project. That homepage is totally customizable, so you can add other widgets or tiles to it. And you also can have multiple of those dashboards. So you could do a dashboard which is providing more the developer information, another dashboard which is, which is um, more providing the data science information, or which you use for reporting to your management or to your, uh, to your project managers. Azure Boards, I was talking about that, is the component which enables us to collaborate in a project. So where we have a common view on the work that has to be done, on the backlog, um, on uh, tasks we have to fulfill. And that's something which can be used by developers as well as by data scientists. So it's accessible via a web page. We have the planning aspect to see which work is planned in which sprint, so in which time frame do we want um, to uh, work on that, uh, on that items. Um, so that's uh, built into, into Azure Boards. Azure Repos is the component for centralized storage of the work we have done. It's a Git repository where developers as well as data scientists can put their work to. Um, and you also see that there are some Jupyter notebooks checked in into the Git repository, which enables you to version your notebooks, but also to enable access for everybody in the team and have a look at the work which has been done. And there is, even in the web interface, through an extension for Azure DevOps, we build in a, a reader component so that you can open the notebook and see the content, either in a nicely rendered way or in the original clear text way, where you can also do some smaller edits directly in the web interface to it. Moving to the pipelines, we do see here a 
quite common build pipeline for developers, uh, building a .NET Core application, in my case, a web application. And as mentioned before, we have a variety of agents available which can uh, run your build. So there are Linux resources, Windows resources, Mac resources, which you can use for your mobile applications, as well as uh, customized build agents you can bring and provide as a private agent. In the release component, we've built a workflow to release our application first to a test environment. And after approvals, uh, we are releasing uh, to two different locations, to data centers in Western Europe, and then also to data centers in the Asia Pacific Rim to get closer to our end users with the application. So to show you the process behind of continuous integration and continuous deployment, we can do a small edit to our web page. Oh, I haven't shown you the application. So the uh, application, it's a website. Um, so we are sending a special formatted request um, to our uh, machine uh, learning component, to a machine learning container that was provided to me by the data scientist um, and um, should represent a, a, an image of a handwritten three. Uh, and we get in return the result that the service recognized um, the value of three. And below that, uh, we have a picture which are going to change to initiate a run through that process. Um, in that case, very nice picture. It's a research project of ours to put data centers into the sea. And that's a container where we, uh, which we sunk in the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean, uh, which contains uh, data center components. But let's get back to our repo and to our homepage. And I've prepared a, uh, prepared a very small change here. So we are changing the picture in here. Uh, of course, we do want to edit. So we are not using an IDE here for this small change, doing that directly in the uh, web interface. So that's it. And we commit these changes. We can do a comment here, say changed picture. And with committing that change to the Git repository, we kick off the inter continuous integration and continuous deployment uh, of our application. So when you do that in a real world scenario, you will not directly accept the commit. So you will have um, uh, to create a pull request, which is also built in into the platform, a pull request and branching and merging uh, um, experience. Um, and you would do some additional uh, security checks uh, during that pull request uh, for having a review of the code changes by a colleague um, running through some code analysis. Um, which we didn't do here uh, to uh, stick to a simple example. And when we look to the build pipeline, we do see that a new build has been kicked off and that we are running through the processes which we defined uh, for, uh, the build, uh, for the build environment. So we are building the application, creating an application package, creating our container, or the container uh, has been uh, already prepared by our data scientist, and then publish these results and move over to release. In the release part, we also see that uh, a release has automatically been kicked off, that we are here in the process of deploying our application 
we can also have a look at uh, the actual work the agent is doing here. Uh, so we downloaded our artifact, are deploying our artifacts to our uh, web, uh, to our managed web service. And then we are here pulling a container, a Docker container, with the machine learning component, which has been done by our uh, data scientist. So in that case, the data scientist worked in Azure Machine Learning, did the training of the model in uh, Azure Machine Learning, uh, put it into a container registry, and I'm pulling the container here from the registry and uh, deploying it uh, to, um, uh, to a container uh, platform. Um, in that case, it is Azure Container Instances, which is not a full Kubernetes environment, which is an environment which enables us to run single containers. So very easy to use, very easy to give uh, the model a try without uh, uh, having to care about a lot of, uh, a lot of infrastructure. So when we look into our release pipeline, and that's uh, something I uh, do want to show you in, in, in more detail, we have deployment tasks in here as well. And in our deployment tasks, uh, we are pulling the container from a, from a registry um, and um, logging into, into, into our registry um, and um, uh, pulling the information. The interesting part here is that we can use variables in that process. So um, in that case, I have defined uh, different registries um, and different passwords for our registries. And when the deployment is running in a certain context, so when we are deploying to the test environment or when we are deploying to the production environment, we can use different values which specify if you are using, for example, a test environment, a test database, or the production and real-world scenario. So when we do a refresh on our web application here, um, and that's also publicly accessible to you, it's called BAT EI. So we are developers EI at azurewebsites.net. We see that we changed the picture and have here a nice picture of the CEO of We Are Developers and the CEO of Microsoft. Uh, so we successfully run through the continuous integration and continuous deployment process. So with that, I already used uh, pretty much of the time. Um, at the end, the summary, I hope I showed you that DevOps is uh, something which is relevant for developers and data scientists as well. Uh, there are tools available where both roles can collaborate and um, do a joint project. Um, and my call to action at the end is, is here with some of the URLs. Um, most of the stuff I've shown you today is free, so give it a try. Um, do your first experience uh, with this uh, tool set, and thank you very much for your attention.